Thank you so much, boys. Not just for the message and the lovely music, but for the obvious passion with which you sang that. Thank you so much. Before we read the scriptures, I need to make a comment or two, but I want it to be as brief as possible because I don't want to take anything away from what these fellows have brought to the meeting through that singing. <clears throat> but I do want to say, a very, very sincere thank you for the privilege, and I mean that, the privilege of being here for the past two weeks. I greatly enjoyed the two weeks in Oba back in the November time or whenever it was, and it has been just equally as good here, and we're so grateful. Thank you for your support. Thank you for encouragement. Thank you for your prayers. I went to Bible College a little over 50 years ago, 50 years and six months now, and I have very, very little preaching around Oma all of my life. I spent 12 years in England, in Scotland, in Wales, Republic of Ireland, all over the north of Ireland, not a part of the British Isles that haven't had the privilege of sharing the gospel. And actually, in the last few years since I retired, well, a year before I retired, in the last three, nearly four years since I retired, I've been around Oma more than the rest of my life, and uh, I'm grateful for that. The Lord gave me a verse a few years ago, and it was this, the Lord shall do more for you than at your beginnings, much more for you not at the, in the latter end than at the beginnings. Now we look forward to what that greater thing will be, and I believe it will be greater yet. The Lord has... Uh, great purposes of blessing in store 
Uh, some of you have been following what's been happening in the Asbury Seminary in the United States. If you're on social media, you couldn't help but notice it. And while there are always skeptics, and there are those who have their varying views, it does seem, at least from those who are spiritual and those who are discerning, it does seem that there's a stirring again of the Spirit of God. And the revival seems to be at least breaking out in some measure there in the United States, spreading from one university to another. And I don't know how you feel, but uh, I feel. And we often pray that the Lord will send that back to Northern Ireland again. Happened before, started off in the States and came here to Northern Ireland in the, in the uh, 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 hundred plus years ago. And we trust that we will really see it again. I also got to say it's been a great privilege to share with our brother, the Reverend William Park. I said it the first night, we go back a long time. In fact, I owe a great deal uh, to Billy as I know him. I owe a great deal to him because it was when he and a couple of fellow faith mission workers missioned the other side of Oma and way down around Newton Stewart. Some of you will have heard of Droit, one or two of you will know where that is. And that was a particularly blessed mission. And uh, we as a family, my brothers and I, all got a tremendous lot of help and blessing in that mission. And we look back on that as a time of a turning point. I'll tell you one of the things that he did to me. <laughs> I was a shy teenager. And he arrived up on a Saturday afternoon on his way into Oma, going to the open air meeting there in the centre of the town. And he said, what are you doing this evening, boys? Are you coming to the open air? And he said it in such a way that I couldn't say no. <laughs> and it was probably the best thing that ever happened as a 16, 17 year old. I was landed in the open air and a microphone pushed into my hand and invited to share a few verses of scripture. And that was the start. Thank you. And uh, we give God the glory. Let, let's get to business. Let's read together from Matthew chapter 23. I wonder is there a glass of water? No, there's not one here. For some reason or other I'll need. You can't be doing with dry preachers, can you? So I need a wee, uh, drink. Now we're going to read from Matthew chapter 23. Matthew's Gospel in chapter 23. Now before uh, I read this, I want to explain to you the context of this. Jesus is speaking some of the sternest words he ever spoke in his entire ministry. And that's the first part of this that I want to read. It's Matthew 23 from verses uh, 13 right through to 37, and then the tone changes utterly and completely. So Matthew chapter 23, and we'll start reading at verse 13 in just a second. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, whether, but for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift, Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ye ought to have... Uh, 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 ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, or strain out a gnat, and swallow a camel. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like and, uh, you like unto, uh, are like unto whited sepulchres, which, in a te- which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye are also outwardly appear righteous unto men. But within, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses uh, unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them that killed the prophets." Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Archias whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now the tone changes completely. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye say, uh, till, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh God, our Father, we want to praise you for the lovely sense of your presence with us in this building tonight. And we thank you that we have your word open before us. And we're coming before you tonight to pray that you would speak very powerfully through your word tonight. We pray, O God, that by your spirit you'll take the simplest of truths and you'll apply them with great power. We pray, O God, tonight that there may be a shaft of light come to hearts and minds in this meeting. We pray, O God, that there will be a deepening conviction of sin and need. We pray, O God, tonight that a spirit of repentance might sweep over this meeting tonight. We pray, O God, that your amazing love and grace and mercy and, O, your tender compassion, your loving kindness would so grip souls tonight that they would be drawn powerfully to the foot of the cross. O God, we pray that you will move by your Spirit amongst us in this final night of this mission. We look to you, O God, that you will have your own way. Lord, take the simplicity of this little message, we pray, and grant that the Lord Jesus will be truly exalted and glorified. In his lovely name we pray. Amen. 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 I expect most of you have already guessed what the text is tonight. Those of you that are anyway familiar with the Bible, you will know that. Here it is. It's verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. I hesitated about reading the series of eight woes that come prior to this. Actually, this is the most scathing attack that Jesus ever launched on anybody. All of us tonight, I'm sure, associate the words of Christ as being full of mercy and grace and love and compassion. And this this, uh, series of eight woes that he launched are, as I say, the most scathing that he ever spoke. And who did he save them for? He saved them for the religious leaders of the nation of Israel at that time. If you had, well, we, I don't want to go through them all, but 
Let's remember this. Let's remember that the man of sorrows who hung on a cross is also a man of severity. And if ever you needed that uh, illustrated, you certainly have it here right before us. Jesus was coming right to the very end of his ministry here. This was probably on the Tuesday before Good Friday. And after he has launched this I attack on these religious leaders, and uh, for obvious reasons they launched the attack, Jesus stands up and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That's why I said the tone changes. Because what we have here is a picture of the Lord Jesus standing outside of the city of Jerusalem, looking down upon the city, and he weeps. And what we have here in this verse is the parting wheel of rejected mercy, of rejected grace, of rejected love. There is nothing that stings, that hurts more than the rejection of love, the rejection of this mercy and this grace. Listen to what Jesus had to say to these, these people. He accused them of being hypocrites, blind fools, whited sepulchres, serpents, murderers. And the problem with all of these people was their hypocrisy and their blindness. I, I, I think that highlights something to us. The absolute disaster of endeavoring to show something outward or trying to accomplish, accomplish something outward to try to please God, when inside there is the desperate need for a work of God's saving grace. Jesus turned harshly and sternly on these Pharisees and these people who were indeed such hypocrites. But let me emphasize again that what we have here is appalling sternness against these hypocritical leaders, but it's combined with intense pity. And I would hate anybody to go away from this meeting tonight thinking, oh, we had a picture from the preacher tonight of a savior who was harsh and hard. He was harsh on hypocrites, but he expressed deep pity and loving mercy to the people that he, uh, he literally was breaking his heart over. The parting wheel of rejected love, or we might sometimes, and we have called it, a lament from the lips of the Savior. Somebody put it like this, there was pent up emotion in the heart of Christ and it breaks out in a lamentation for the city that had denied him. You see, just a week, well, just days before, Christ had entered the city riding on a donkey, not on a white horse, on a little donkey, and the people threw off their clothes and their garments and they spread them before him. They pulled down palm branches and they spread the way. And uh, they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were welcoming Christ into the city. But within days, these religious leaders were plotting to, to kill Christ. And there's this uh, uh, deep lamentation. My first little point tonight, and these points are very simple this evening. First little point I wanted to make is we, we see the groaning of Christ, the groaning of our Lord Jesus, the weeping, the, the, the emotion that there was here. You know what the shortest verse in the Bible is, do you? I hope so. Jesus wept. It's in, it is the shortest verse so that we might remember that Jesus knew what it was to weep. Of course, he wept at the grave of Lazarus. No doubt there was emotion and tenderness because his good friend had died. But I honestly think the weeping, the, the, that which brought the tears to the Savior at the grave of Lazarus was not just the emotion of someone who had died. The weeping was more because of their unbelief, because of their rejection of him. And he wept there. But there is no doubt whatever. The, uh, uh, as Jesus stood over the city, he was weeping because of their blindness and their hardness of heart. Look at the number of times that Jesus says in this passage in Matthew and this passage that we have read. He said in verse 16, you fools and blind. 
Verse 16, you blind guides. Verse 17, you fools and blind. Verse 19, you fools and blind. You see, when light comes to us, when we understand the way of salvation, when we get an understanding that Christ died on the cross for our sins, when we realize that he was the sacrifice for sin, he became the curse for our sin. And when we understand that it's only as we repent of our sin and come to him and respond to his love and open our hearts to him, we get light, we get an understanding that that's the way of salvation. And sometimes when people get an understanding of that, they reject it. And I'll tell you what happens to rejected light. It becomes darkness. And a veil comes. And a darkness comes. We've seen it again and again in evangelistic ministry over the years. People who get light and when they reject it, the light actually becomes darkness. And that was what was going on with these people here. So the groaning of Christ came, first of all, the first place, because of blindness and hardness of heart. The second reason Jesus wept here was because of providential opportunity. Now, Mention was made here tonight about, you know, the mission being planned and uh, um, both our, our brother Reverend Park and I were contacted to see if we could fit in the dates and so on. And of course there was a church board and so on organizing it. But I want to tell you something tonight. This mission was planned in eternity past. God had his hand upon it. God knew, the Lord knew that this mission would come together. And the Lord in his gracious plan ordained it. My, it sent us lovely weather so that we could hear here every night. And God has been with us. And God gives special opportunities. God visits communities. God visits homes. God visits families. And there's special times of visitation. And for this, for this uh, city, what did Jesus say to them? How often? Well, uh, he, he said this, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are, what's the word? that are sent unto thee. You see, God sends the evangelist. God sends the message. God speaks. God ordains these opportunities. But of course, when he was speaking here about the prophets that were sent unto him, who were the prophets that were sent to the city? You know, the, the holy city, Jerusalem, the religious capital of Judaism, Jerusalem, the special place. Who were sent well, there was the major prophets. Can you quote them? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the four major prophets. There's all the minor prophets. What about John the Baptist? What was his message to these people? His message was straight and it was strong. He said to them, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message was abundantly clear as it came to them. Then we have, following that, we have the early church. They were a powerful witness in the city. The early church, there was the 12 apostles and the disciples. And they were given an opportunity to respond. God gives special times of opportunity. And what did these people do? They absolutely rejected the Lord Jesus. They denied him. How many opportunities has God given you? It's a wonderful privilege to be brought up in a part of the world where we have Sunday schools still, where we have children's events, where so many of us tonight have heard the gospel from childhood. We have attended gospel missions. We've been in church. We've heard the gospel preached. We've heard beautiful singing that's conveyed the message of the gospel. All of those things. How many of us had... I've had the great privilege of having praying parents, praying friends. You know, one of the things about this mission that has been outstanding to me and the previous mission in, in Oma is the, the impact that the, uh, the impact of the prayer meetings. You know, sometimes people meet to pray and they, they just pray for the community, but not on this, these prayer meetings. They pray for individuals. They pray for people. That's a tremendous blessing, folks. One of the greatest privileges in life is to know that there's somebody who cares about you and prays for you. That's why Jesus was weeping. 
providential opportunity given. And somebody mentioned the, in, a, in a comment earlier the words of Elijah. How long do you halt? How long do you falter between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him. But of Baal, follow him. You see, the way of salvation has been made clear. And we halt between two opinions. Listen, the Savior wept. What was the first reason? Because of their blindness and their darkness and their hardness. The Savior wept because this was their time of opportunity. And here's the third thing that I want to say. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And I want to address this tonight because it may well be for someone perhaps in this mission. Perhaps there's somebody who thinks, this is not really for me. I haven't been elected. It's not possible for me to be saved. I want to tell you, you'll know that you're elected when you come to Christ. Listen, the scripture is absolutely clear. Him that cometh unto me, I will not cast out. And even though he launched this attack upon these religious hypocrites, these Pharisees, the message is abundantly clear tonight. Listen to what he said. I, what is it, does it say here? I would, oh, I would. Uh, how often would I, but you would not. And if you take nothing else from the service tonight, will you get this? He says, I would. But what did they say? They would not. Or this, uh, Jesus says, they would not. God has no pleasure whatever in the death of the wicked. You know, God cannot, he cannot deny himself. Paul writing to young Timothy said this, he cannot deny himself. He, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Now, do you understand it tonight? That, Jesus, that God cannot deny himself. And if you will come, he will receive you. If you'll respond to his love, you will. You will not be cast out, but you'll be taken in. You'll be welcomed. You will be received. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 2 Peter 3, 8. God is not willing that any should perish, but that who? A selected number? No, no. But that all should come to repentance. Salvation is for you tonight. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God delivers what he promises. It's a bona fide offer. Not like these old Pharisees. Oh, they made promises, but they didn't fulfill them. They couldn't fulfill them. And they tried to shut up those that were entering in. See, that was one of the severest criticisms of these Pharisees. They wouldn't go into the kingdom of God. They, wouldn't, they, they rejected Jesus outright. And then those who did want to embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord and acknowledge him as the Messiah, what did they do? They did their best to stop them getting in. No wonder Jesus was hard on them. But I tell you again, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Why did he weep? Because of their blindness and darkness. He wept because he knew that this was their providential, this was their opportunity. And he wept because he had no, uh, no, has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Move on from the groaning of Christ and we'll look at the compassion of Christ. How often would I? Remember this is the eternal son of the living God. The one who laid aside his glory and came into this world as a little babe in Bethlehem. The one who stood at the carpenter's shop. The one whom God sent to be our savior. The one who went to the cross and laid down his life for us. This is the one tonight who says, how often, what is it? Would I? How often would I? It's a personal relationship. Get it tonight. God cares about you. You know, we're not asked to come and sign, sign a creed. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? You're not asked to sign a creed. We're not asked to follow a code. What are we talking about tonight? We're talking about entering into a vital, living, personal relationship 
with the eternal God, his blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to come into your life and be your Savior. God deals with people face to face. He deals with us as individuals. You know, I look over a crowd tonight, look over a group of people. You might say God looks down upon the millions in this world. He does. And he knows every one of us by name and he knows every single thing about us. But I want to tell you this. God knows you as an individual. There's nothing he doesn't know about you. There is no fault. There is no uh, uh, nothing that has happened in your past. You can't hide anything from God. The Lord knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. And he wants to meet us face to face, eh? Face to face. That's what he did with Moses. Remember Saul of Tarsus, an angry, bitter man, a persecutor of the church, a blasphemer. And God met with him face to face on the Damascus Road. And he wants to meet you as an individual, as a, an individual person. Isaiah, he saw the Lord. We could think, we could think about loads of people that came face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we come to know him. And he comes to know us. Think of the psalmist David. Imagine being able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. I know him. Do you know that? Or is God just someone out there? Or is, he, is it personal? Is it a sweet, personal, vital relationship with him? Didn't Jesus say, I am the good shepherd, and I? No. Eh? I know my sheep. You've not been asked to sign a creed. You give credence to a certain uh, a, a jumble of words or a code or anything else. It's a vital personal relationship with him. Well, the compassion of Christ is demonstrated here in a personal relationship with him. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Come into your life, pardon your sin, give, uh, pour his grace upon you, transform you and change you, conform you more and more into his likeness. That's what the gospel is about, changing you, transforming you. Personal relationship. Then the second wee point I want to make here in the compassion of Christ is his tender disposition. This is beautiful, and I'm glad we're in a part of, the, part of the world where the congregation will kind of know what we're talking about. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. If I was around Belfast and I started to talk about a hen gathering her chicks under her wings, the 99% of the people, unless they're yuppies, you know, and have a few hens in their backyard or whatever, of course that's more and more common now, people don't know what it's like for to have an old clock and hen and have a few chicks around the farmyard. Maybe some of you younger folk mightn't know, but I think you have a reasonable idea in this part of the world. The old mother hen, she cares about her chicks. And if there's a cat, or there's a dog, or there's something in the air, a buzzard, bird of prey, that mother hen will know about it long before you or I would maybe know about it, and that mother hen will act like a flash. And if any of you have seen it happen, you'll hear the cluck of the old mother hen. It's sharp, but it's a sharp cluck. For what purpose? To alert those wee chicks to danger. And you know what they do? Those chicks know the sound of that mother hen, and they run. She opens her wings, and they run. And where are they? They're in under the wings of the mother hen. What do they go for? They go because they know it's a place of absolute safety. Jesus said, I am come to seek chicks, lost souls. What does he want to do? I'm come to seek and to save, not chase you out. Like chasing the wee chick out for the hen or for the for the for, for, for the uh, the cat or the dog to lay hold, take them as, take them as prey. Here we have it. Can I remind you tonight of that beautiful verse in Jeremiah? Yes. I have loved you 
with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. With loving kindness, I have drawn you. See the picture of the hen. That hen cares about the chicks. Jesus Christ cares about you. He made the hens. He made the chicks. He's the creator of all things. He knows exactly where you're at tonight. And maybe you think the, old, the squawk of the old mother hen at night and sound wonderful. But that chick knows what it's about. Have you heard that sound? It's not a squawk of a mother hen. But you've heard the sound of the warning. It's time to come to safety. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. It's a lovely sight. If you haven't seen it, go somewhere to one of these farms and some of the, if you haven't seen the, 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 an old clock and hen bringing her chicks in, boy, it's something to watch. And Jesus takes this simple farmyard story to illustrate one of the greatest truths in the Bible, that he loves you and cares about you and wants to bring you into that place of safety. And I want to tell you tonight, there's not a chick, not one, that he won't bring under his wings. He's not going to exclude you tonight. He brings you in for what purpose? The third wee point is intimate fellowship under his wings. Under his wings. Let me remind you of Psalm 91. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. We've preached throughout these last couple of weeks, and on several nights we've talked about the refuge. Let me remind you of the psalmist in Psalm 46, where he says, God is our refuge and our strength. When did uh, good King Hezekiah write those words, God is our refuge and our strength? The Assyrian army were camped outside the city of Jerusalem. They were about to uh, sweep in and wipe out that city that cut off the water supply. But good King Hezekiah had built a conduit up into the uh, Kidron Valley. And here was the pool of Siloam full of beautiful fresh water. And here is the king writing, God is our refuge and our strength. I want to tell you tonight, God is a refuge in him. We find a place of protection, a place of safety. We talked the other night about the judgment coming upon the uh, land of Egypt because of uh, Pharaoh's refusal to let the people go. And God prepared a way by which the children of Israel made him a place of refuge. You know the story. They shed blood of the lamb. They took the bunch of hyssop and dipped it in the blood and when it was applied to the doorposts and the lintels, what happened? There was the place of refuge. They were under his wings. What a place of refuge tonight. He brings you into that place of intimate fellowship. Uh, uh, of intimate fellowship. It's a place of safety. I love Romans 1 and 8, don't you? There is now no condemnation, no judgment, no uh, uh, disaster. There is no judgment coming upon you. If you are in Christ, there is now, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. For the fearful, there is a place of safety. For the sinful, there is a place of forgiveness. There's a place of satisfaction. You know, I, 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 I thought today about who Jesus really welcomed in. You know, we think of the, the, the chicks, they would be all of a sameness. But you know, in an amazing way, the Lord brings in all sorts. Just you think about it. Who did Jesus uh, heal and touch and save? The lepers. The lepers were outcasts, but he brought them in. He brought in the untouchables, you might say. He brought in the demon-possessed. He brought in the dying thief. He was an absolute blasphemer, but he brought him in. And I'll tell you what else. He brought in the perverted. And if ever there was a society where there are so many people that are living in sexual perversion. I want to say to you tonight, Jesus can bring them in. How do we know that? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, he talks about those and he says, 
you are washed. Talks about the immorality, a whole list of people that were living in, in, in sexual sin and immorality. And he says, and you are washed, and such were some of you. Oh, he brings them in. He brings in the sinful. He brings in the fretful. There is nowhere, there is nowhere so comfortable tonight as to be near to the heart of God. There is no more warmer, comfortable place, no safer place than to be under his wings. Don't be weary of sin. Be weary of your brokenness. Weary, weary of the life you're, you're living. I want to tell you tonight, he wants to bring you in under his wings. Place of intimate fellowship. Let me move to the last wee point here tonight. Uh, it's the rejection by Christ. Here we have this beautiful picture of loving kindness, tender mercy, amazing grace. And then we have these words. The hen gathers her chickens under her wings. And you would not. And you would not. Or another translation puts it, you were not willing. You would not listen. Then this deliberate refusal, Jesus points it out here clearly, this deliberate refusal, what does it bring? It brings the, the, the pronouncement of destruction on this city. Listen to these words. Your house is left unto you desolate, absolutely desolate. And that was totally fulfilled when in AD 70, 71, somewhere in that, uh, around about that time, the Roman armies came in and the city of Jerusalem was razed to the ground, absolutely wiped out, not a stone standing on the top of the wall. You talk about the Russians destroying Mariupol in, 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 in eastern Ukraine. This was an even vaster destruction. The, the city was absolutely wiped out. And why? Why? You say, why did that desolation, why did that destruction come? Simple reason, you were not willing and obedient. They were rebellious. You know, the Bible teaches us that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Eh? Do you equate stubbornness and rebellion with witchcraft? I hope nobody, I hope nobody ever touches the Ouija board or touches anything belonging to the occult or anything that's satanic. It's evil. It'll destroy you. But listen, rebellion and stubbornness is equated with, uh, with, with uh, it says it's a sin of witchcraft. Where do we read that? We read that in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and, and verse 23. Who was the character involved? He was King Saul and he was toppled off his throne. He was rejected as being king, and his downfall was all because of stubbornness and rebellion. Listen, this was a sad note for the city, wasn't it? A sad note. Your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate's a strong word, isn't it? Desolate means wiped out. Desolate means completely and utterly destroyed. Desolate means no life left. It's a bare waste place. That's the picture of the city here. And if we do what these people did, remain stubborn and rebellious, we hear the call of the Lord Jesus, come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we stubbornly refuse. And we reject the Savior's wooing, tender words, if we reject them. Let me pre preface this comment by the words, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But I tell you, if we reject the call of Christ, if we refuse his offer of mercy, there is only one result. And the result is desolation. What did Jesus say to these uh, Pharisees and scribes, these uh, other hypocrites? Jesus said to them, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? How can you escape? Your house is left unto you utterly desolate. 
Help me finish with just a simple story tonight. The story is told of in the West Country, Devon, Cornwall, way down in the West uh, of England, the West Country it's called, there was uh, a gypsy family that travelled around many, many years ago. There was the old gypsy caravan horse drawn. It had been an exceptionally wet season. And some of the bridges in those little villages from moving over one stream to another, some of those uh, bridges were timber, made of timber. And because of the exceptionally wet season, the timbers were wet. Some of them had begun to rot a bit uh, at the edges and they were slippy and dangerous. The gypsy family were making their way to a site where they were going to stay and they were crossing this stream that was in full flow. In fact, it was overflowing. It was uh, in spate. It was a, 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 a very wet, difficult back end, as we say. As they were crossing that little river, going to the other side, the old gypsy cart overturned. In that cart was the gypsy mother with her little boy. He was only a young lad, but it was a young lad who had learned to swim. Many of those gypsy lads were well able to do it, half lived in the water. And uh, the mother was thrown into the fast flowing stream. The gypsy boy, being a strong swimmer, very quickly made for the bank and uh, endeavored to, uh, well, shook himself down and uh, seeing his mother being carried away off in the stream. He ran as fast as he could downstream and he jumped in and he got a hold of his mother. She was so desperate to save herself, she fought off the hand that would save him. She kept struggling and she fought off the hand. She kept fighting off his hand. Eventually, the wee boy became utterly exhausted and he had no option but to let his mother's hair go. He grabbed her by the hair. He did everything he could to bring her to the bank. Her body was recovered days later. The gypsy funeral, the story goes, the gypsy funeral was held. And after the committal, this uh, old uh, gypsy mother, the boy was hiding behind a gravestone uh, not far away from the place where his mother was buried. And they could hear him weeping, as you might understand the boy would do. It wasn't, oh, my mother. It was, mother, I would have saved you, but you wouldn't let me. I would have saved you, but you wouldn't let me. She fought off the only hand that could have saved her. How often would I have gathered you in as a hen gathers her chicks, but you fought off the striving of the Spirit. You rejected his offer of mercy and forgiveness in Christ. You rejected his pleas to come, leaving services, doing something else to try to obscure the message that you've heard perhaps, doing things to try to alleviate yourself and try to drown out the conviction of sin. Wouldn't it be a tragedy? Wouldn't it be a tragedy if you were like that gypsy mother? The Lord says, I would have saved you. Now, let me emphasize, God is all-powerful. He's absolutely sovereign. But listen, you and I are being invited. And the Lord is graciously drawing some of us tonight. And he's bringing us to that place of rescue. He's bringing us to the bank. Don't do what that gypsy mother did. Fought off the hand that would save you. And don't have the Savior weeping. I would have saved you. But you wouldn't let me. Will you let him save you tonight? Will you repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. 
I'm sorry for holding out so long. I'm so sorry that I've gone my own way for far too long. Will you say tonight, Lord, I don't understand it all. I don't see it all. But on faith tonight, Lord, I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to put my life in your hands and respond to your love. Let me finish with one verse. Come unto me. All ye that are that labor and are heavy laden. How do I feel somehow tonight that there's somebody and you're just weary, weary of sin and weary of resisting, weary of all that's been happening in your life. You're just weary. Come on to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. What does Jesus say? I'll give you rest. Does that sound sweet? I'll give you rest. He will. One condition. You've got to come. Will you come tonight? Will you respond in the closing moments of the service and say, I'm coming. Lord, I'm coming tonight. We prayer as Paul will rejoin us undoubtedly in a second. He's right here. We prayer together. And I hand the closing part of the meeting over to him. Father, just thank you for the gracious dealing of your spirit in this meeting. Thank you that we feel the tug. We hear the voice. We sense your presence. You're touching some heart, uh, more, than, more than one heart. Lord, you're touching every heart. Oh, we thank you for your love tonight, your loving kindness, your tender mercy. Lord, we pray tonight that you'll give grace to folks who's, who are struggling to say the battle's over and I'm, I, I can no longer resist. Lord, it's over to you. Lord, granted we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for listening to this mission message. It may be that this message has deeply challenged your heart concerning your need of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is so, please contact us for help and prayer and literature using the information that will now appear on the screen. It'll be our privilege to help you in any way that we possibly can. God bless you, your friend in Christ's service, Pastor Paul Johnston of Fintana Independent Methodist Church.